Hi guys, it is Julia and Kitty Cat. And I'm Kismet. And yeah, <laughs> and if you can explain what you're you do, you're with Liquid Nymph. What is Liquid Nymph? Uh, so Liquid Nymph is a company I started about 20 something years ago when I was in high school. Um, and basically I specialize in making really elegant, feminine, beautiful bondage collars, cuffs and leashes. So taking like really strong, durable leather and metals, like stuff you can actually play with, but then infusing them with really feminine elements like lace and rhinestones and, you know, like fabulous charms and things. So yeah, that's, that's my specialty. Your stuff cool. really, yeah, it's beautiful. Your stuff is a work of art. I find what I find really interesting out of that whole statement is that you started it in high school. Can you explain that origin story for us <laughs> a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So I was a kinky, gothy teenager. And, you know, when you're 17 and you're looking for stuff to play with, like, where are you going to go? You can try to go to like a sex shop because this is like the late 90s and the internet is not the thing that it is today, right? And I'd get chased out of sex shops um, right away and like, okay, well, if I can't buy this stuff and I want to play and I really want to explore this, um, what do I do? So I went to Candy Leather Factory where like the Boy Scouts go to learn to make their wallets and stuff. And they were the sweetest. I had a little line, like a just a cutout drawing of a corset collar that I wanted to make. I wanted it to be really strict and that's its, its own story. Um, it's a good one. But yeah, I really wanted a really tall, strict corset collar. And I was like, this is what I'm looking for. What do I do? And they were like, sure, no problem. Like you'll need these tools and you know, like this is how you make the edges soft. And these are the special scissors that cut through thick, thick leather like that. And then, you know, grommets and all of the things. And that's like where I started, you know, was just they, you know, two dudes at, you know, the leather shop being like, sure. So since you said you started the shop like 20 years ago, how did you even sell things 20 years ago in the late nineties? as like an 18 year old, 19 year old getting into the bondage uh, world. Ah, like, it's I, so. I, go, yeah, go ahead. I just, I just, I, I can only imagine because it's not like there were, Et Etsy was back then. No, I would literally like, I had like a little suitcase, like, and I would walk into, um, like alternative clothing stores. So punk rock stores and uh, gothic boutiques, um, even like some tattoo parlors, things like that, that, you know, seem to have like collections of, of stuff that might be applicable. And so I'd go into these places and just be like, this is what I got, this is what I do. And then they would like, you know, place an order and actually like kind of custom choose, which is what I do now. I've always been about like, I want you to get exactly what you want. So like, if you want mm -hmm. this collar, but in antique brass with like red leather and you know, whatever, like, that's that's what's so much fun for me is making it exactly what they want. So that's what I would do even for like these little gothic and retro and, and um, yeah, like punk rock boutiques that I would go into. And I like think about that now and like, I don't have that kind of nerve now, like to walk right. into a store and be like, oh, hello, I've got stuff you want. And it's, it kind of blows my mind that, yeah, that that's, that's how I did that. Yeah. And uh, Kismet, where, where are you located? Los Angeles. Los Angeles. And have you always been located in Los Angeles or have you bounced around in these 20 years with your business? Pretty much in LA. I lived up in San Francisco for about three years when I was, um, I went to San Francisco State and did sexuality studies up there for about three years. And uh, yeah, so then I would, you know, visit shops up there and yep, do a few things up there too. But that's, that time I was doing, then I was starting to do, excuse me, more like eBay. Because at that time, eBay was actually kind of, Etsy-ish before yeah. it got really overwhelmed yeah. with just all of the free stuff from, you know, cheap stuff from China. And so I had a long standing eBay business for a long time. And then when that got overwhelmed, you're like, oh no, what do I do now? Because I'm lost here. Um, yeah, and then I started doing more wholesale. So I sell to mm -hmm. like Good Vibrations to all of those boutiques. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, just a lot of like really small, unique, um, you know, like high-end classy erotic boutiques. And you mentioned that you have your degree. What's your degree in? <laughs> well, I actually have a degree in fashion design and marketing, but I started out um, at San Francisco State as okay. a, like with a focus on human sexualities. 
Uh, mm -hmm. even though at that time they didn't have a bachelor's program in it, I figured, well, I'll stick in it. And like, by the time I finish with my bachelor's, they'll have a master's in it. And then that way I can go on to teach sexuality probably like at a university because where else are you teaching that at that time? Um, and then I was really cold and really lonely <laughs> in <Aww>. San Francisco <laughs> and it was really <laughs> expensive. And like the yeah. one person I had connection with who lived up there, he was moving back down to San Diego. And, and I had started taking a whole bunch of fashion design classes at a little city college called Redwood City College. And they were just, it was, it was awesome. And um, yeah, and he was like, why are you gonna stick around in fashion design or in you know like sexuality studies and do academia? like where anybody can do that. Like you have a talent for this fashion stuff and you should do that. And he was actually my daddy dom at the time too. And it's like, okay, between like that kind of encouragement and him leaving and me being cold, lonely and broke in San Francisco, yeah. it's like, okay. And then I moved back down to Los Angeles and, um, and then pursued a fashion design degree at uh, Trade Tech, which is the only trade college, uh, city college that's still left in California. And they were phenomenal, like taught me so much. Yeah, they and then I went to Long Beach State and got a marketing degree, so. So, yeah. so when you say trade tech, like what was the trade tech you did? Was it fashion? Uh, yeah. Manufacturing? Yeah. Okay. No, it was, it was fashion design. Okay. Yeah, so specifically it was, you know, like pattern drafting, draping, garment manipulation. And it wasn't until, um, and I, I was I was literally in college for eight years. I was incredibly blessed that my mom was like, go to school, get a four year degree, do that thing. Like, we'll support you, do that. Like whatever your passion for learning is, do it. And I did, like I took, I don't know, like 18 units a semester. I did summer school, I did winter school, um, all of it. And then when I decided I wanted to go back to fashion school, my mom was kind of horrified because she was like, you're going from a four-year university to a trade school to get an associate's degree. Like, what are you doing? Like, you better go get a real degree when you're done with this. Mm -hmm. And then that's when I went back to Long Beach State. Well, before that, I started working on the fashion merchandising degree because that's a whole different thing, right? Which is almost more like the, the manufacturing side of it. It's the money side of it. Mm -hmm. And I felt like, oh my God, like I can't do that. And my mom was like, you should get a business degree. And I'm like, I'm, I'm the worst with numbers. I've come now to realize that it, like I'm, I've probably got a dyslexic thing going on and I constantly like transcribe them incorrectly. So the answers are always wrong. Anyway, my mom was like, you've got to get this market. You've got to get a business degree because you're so good at it. And I'm like terrified of numbers. And anyway, so I took some fashion merchandising classes and it was there that I had this incredible teacher. Her name was Miss Zinn, I'll never forget her. And she was the one who, cause I'd been doing collars and things just, I knew I was making good money, but I'd never actually written it down and like looked at how much does it cost per square inch of leather? How many minutes does it take me? Like how much does each rivet cost? All of that. And when I like wrote it all down um, and like really looked at it and, and worked through these merchandising classes from that perspective, I was like, holy shit, like this is a real viable business. This isn't just like, tinkering yeah. around yeah mm -hmm. sorry that's the long answer no no if you I want really short like, answers let me know no you're on a podcast long answers are appropriate <laughs> oh, um, good. out of curiosity just to give a range um for our listeners what range does your callers cost like if people want to come and get a caller from you what mm -hmm. should they be looking to spend so yeah, if you go onto my Etsy shop, um, and we'll have, uh, we're, we're launching our own website really, really soon, like in the next couple of weeks. Um, if you're looking at just one of the basic ones that's listed there without choosing a bunch of like color upgrades or modifications, you're looking at starting at around $60. So they're pretty affordable given yeah. what they are. And a lot of times people have the misconception of like, oh, it's got lace on it, isn't that cute? Like, but you can't really play with it, like wrong. You can 100% play with every single thing I make, unless you have custom special requested a super soft buttery leather, then it won't break, but it'll stretch if you get real aggressive, mm -hmm. right? But yeah, so most of my stuff is starting at around $65. Um, and then yeah, like the more that you want to make it your own and add your own details to it, then you know, like the little elements just, you know, we just kind of add that on. And yeah, I love going through the process of figuring out what is it that you want? 
you know, like, what does that look like? And sometimes I have people just send me like a photograph of like, this is my outfit. I don't know what to do, but I know I want a collar. I know I want cuffs and anklets to go with that. And if you can do a chain body harness, if that makes sense with this thing, then great. And I'm like, yeah. fuck yeah. Like that's, that's what I, that's one of the things I love most. But I also love it just when people go on there and like, like there's one collar, it's called Christine. It's actually the one that's featured like on the shop logo. And it's just a basic black brand with flat black lace that's stitched onto it and like a real simple DNO ring on the front. It's our best seller. And I've probably made hundreds of them. And I still love making them. Okay. Like this, this is my workshop here, right? This so is cool. <laughs> this is my sanctuary. Yeah. This is my happy place. Like, uh, and and I come in here. Like, I get orders, and I come in here, and I listen to podcasts, and and make shit. Like, and it's I can spend hours in here, and it's like my favorite place to be. You picked a good business then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it never feels like work. I'm like, yay, get to I make will, some stuff. I will tell you, Kismet, I have a friend who is, uh, uh, she, she's bought a couple of collars from you and she, she uses them in the strip clubs and she makes a lot of money with them. So awesome. Yeah. yeah so it's, mm -hmm. it's the upgrade. It's the upgrade. She, up, she uses as an upgrade on floor dances. So instead of spending like 20, because she's the bondage girl, she gets to charge more for a floor dance. Really? That's, oh, I'm always so interested in like, what are people doing with these? So what yes. is, what does that look like then as the bondage floor dance? Like, how do I, how do I it's, it, it's cater really to those more, people? It's what I understand it more than anything else is she just walks around with your collar and a leash. And for any guy who's into it, you know, uh, cause a basic floor dance is $20 a song, right? You know, yeah standardly and then like she'll be like three for a hundred because of the bondage aspect and wow yeah so yeah like if you want to walk around with her on a leash i guess that's a pretty good yeah. price to do it it is it's, it's a really <laughs> totally. good upsell for a basic thing that totally makes sense that's super cool yeah. i never even thought about putting like stripper in in my listings mm -hmm. you know I'm always thinking oh. of like new creative photo shoots to do. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like that would, to, to plant that picture in the minds of, of dancers, oh, that's good. Yeah. It's funny, I have a marketing degree from 2006, which makes like nothing. And like, it's worthless now in the world of podcasts and Instagram and anyway, yeah. marketing is definitely like the biggest place that I struggle. So I'm always fascinated to hear, you know, like how people are using my things, what other markets are there that are out there how do I better serve them? What do they need? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, cool. They're, 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 they are a market with an, a large expendable income that are willing to spend like three or $400 on a pair of shoes because that might right. make them some money, so. Yeah, huh. How do I, I get at them? <laughs> I, yeah. I am enjoying this now because this is mm -hmm. you're like, Ooh. <laughs> I almost feel like influencer marketing would, marketing would be a good way to do it. Like find, go to a club, find the top girl in the club and give her like a gorgeous collar and be like, let me know how this works out for you. And if it goes good yeah. for her, all the other girls in the club are going to be buying collars. Right. Yeah, you my know? friend was telling me I should do the same thing with um, cam girls. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, once people prove that it makes money, because that's all they really care about, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. But, it, it, and I think it's kind of fun. I actually kind of think it's fun, the idea of these guys would get to go to a strip club and mm -hmm. have a mini BDSM fantasy. Because in Vegas, we don't have dungeons. It's not legal here. Right. Um so I feel like that's like a way of getting around the dungeon rule. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Are are the strip clubs in Vegas back open yet? <sighs> I don't, uh, not yet. Yeah, I, don't I, don't I don't think so. so. We still I, have, I, Vegas is pretty, I mean, we've opened up a lot of things. Our casinos are pretty open. Um, it's, it's actually kind of, at, I, I don't want to say out crazy maybe outrageous how quickly we've opened in a way everything seems but yeah club strip clubs haven't opened showrooms haven't opened yet um mm -hmm. and i think like stadiums haven't opened yet and that's really it okay yeah 
I know, right? It's... I'll find I'll find the girls online doing shows. I guess that's the oh, yeah. next step. Yeah. Then mm. yeah, we there are plenty. So <laughs> <laughs> now, are all your relationships? Um, are they kind of based around this BDSM world or do you have a vanilla life outside of this as well? Fairly, uh, fairly vanilla, but poly, but like super selective, poly prude. Like, yeah, um, I developed really, my husband and I have been together for 13 years, 13 years, mm -hmm. something like that, 12, 13, yeah. Uh, and yeah, like, my whole aspect of like kink was pretty shut down for a long time. I was very, very heavily into it in, in my early, early 20s. And then somewhere like in my early, like probably hmm, 23, 24, like I completely lost my sex drive, um, likely due to birth control. They mm -hmm. put me on one of those packs. You wanna hear the headache story? The headache story will make some of this make more sense. Yeah, go ahead, go for it. Okay. it. <laughs> so part of, so, you know, I was telling you at the beginning, like I really wanted to make a super tall bondage collar that lace up the back like a corset. That specific concept came um, as a result of, I literally had a headache for three years, nonstop. I would oh. wake up in the morning and within half an hour of waking up, like my head would start exploding and it was like all over the place, right? Like sometimes it was like a stabbing pain in my eyeball mm -hmm. or like this dull pancake of pain on my head my teeth would hurt, like ice pick in the back of the brain, you name it, and it would just crawl all over my head. But um, yeah, like it was like doctors would be just like, oh, you know, like take some Motrin or whatever and no medication ever solved it. So I kind of developed this distrust for <laughs> pharmaceuticals and medication, like they don't work or do anything. Like, yeah, if I've got an abscess, you know, like some kind of massive wound. Yeah, I'll take some antibiotics if like pus is coming out of me, but otherwise I don't take medication yeah. because that was my experience Like nothing helps, nothing works. And, and then I started having a really crunchy jaw, right? Like you could hear this from across the room. I promise this is going somewhere, but you could hear my jaw from like across the room while I'm eating. And my mom decided she's like, we need to resolve that because that's not okay. And she, was brilliant and she took me to a TMJ specialist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the first thing they do is they measure my legs. And cause if your legs are different lengths then your hips are mm -hmm. off, which means your spine is off and your neck is off and your jaw is off, right? Everything goes all the way up. And my legs are the same length and they sit me down in this, you know, one of those massage chairs so they can poke on the back of your neck and he's got a little book. And he says, where do you feel this? And I'm like, that's the stabbing pain in my eyeball. Right, okay, where do you feel that? He's like, oh, that's that dull throbbing pain on the back of my head. And just keeps on going through this. He's like, okay, cool. Like your textbook, you have myofascial referred pain. Fascia. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So tiny, yeah. so. I, I, was gonna, I was gonna say probably fascia. It was a fascia issue. Yeah, totally a fascia issue. Yeah. And so trigger points all over like my neck, back, shoulders were just super agitated from shitty posture. Mm. So, so what's a gothy kinky teenager, you know, to do if they've got, you know, this requirement to improve their posture, I made a posture collar and that's how that very first design started. Do you want to see it? It's like, I yes. would love to see it, please. Yeah. Grab it. Grab it. <laughs> oh my God. She's so happy. I know. I'm so happy to see so, it. You, no, but like she's dancing around for anyone listening on the audio. It's so cute. Oh, that's so <laughs> pretty. How cute is that? Nice. Is, is it a bat? Is it look like it's, a bat? Yeah, it yeah looks like basically Batman's, looks like a bat. It looks like Batman's signal. Yeah, it looks like right? Batman's signal, yeah. So, so yeah, like that point at the top would kind of encourage it to stay up. But you can see like it's old and it's soft and it's warm and it's not like this is like digging in really, you know, like, and then it would lace up the back like that. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, and there's just, there's no way to slouch in this thing. And it was yeah. warm and it was comfortable and like it retrained me to like sit up straight and and yeah like my headaches within like a couple of weeks went away i was i was just like mind blown and and then i liked that thing so much that i started i was like everybody should have one right, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> i'm in love with the thing i created like the world needs to know and and that was actually the impetus um, you know, like for actually doing the first thing, but then also like the aspect of the, you know, the gothic kinky teenager without access, 
like it was uh, all of these pieces together that you know resulted in in this being the thing I do now. There was a beginning to that story, and now I can't really think of. Oh, wait, we're starting. You were saying that at 24 you got put on birth control, and that oh yeah, 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 yeah. So my sex drive like completely crashed, um, and. Yeah, and was is was I was fairly like asexual probably until 2014 or so. And I met my husband in 2008, um, and but he came into my life when I was in the midst of like intense um, mourning and loss when my brother died. Mm. So yeah, like there's a lot of stories here, um, but. So he came into into my life like that, and of course, like any you know, like new relationship, like you're gonna be hot and heavy, like most a lot of people a lot of the time, right? Like that, all those sparks are flying because new relationship energy is so high, you know, like and and then part of like our secure attachment happened as a result of like I was just breaking down, crying every day, and he would just hold me, right? And so we just got very securely bonded, and even you know, like even though I was fairly asexual for like the first eight years of our relationship, he was still 100% devoted to me. And it didn't really matter that much to him that the sexual component wasn't there. But then after a while, I'm like, what the fuck is going on with me? Like this level of not interested in sex and this level of like, fuck, you've got to drop, jump through a whole lot of hoops to like mm -hmm. get me to, to say yes, to turn on. And then when sex would happen, it was amazing. You know, like, like why am I not saying yes to this? Like, why am I making it so hard? Um, and, and yeah, like, and then I met a doctor who um, did muscle testing, you know, which is this, this, this whole business of like, you know, like where's their strength in your, it's a whole thing, look it up. But it's a mm -hmm. naturopathic method for like determining like what, what your body needs. And he was like, you're crazy low on iodine and you're B vitamin deficient. And anybody who, any woman who's been on hormonal birth control for any length of time, it will disrupt your B vitamin um, processing capabilities. I don't know the details there. I don't know if it's like how you absorb it or, um, you know, like how it's utilized or fixed in the body. I don't know the details, but it fucks up the B vitamin system. And when that shit's all super low, the likelihood of you really, you know, like being in arousal and turn on like goes down. So he put me on, you know, like a couple of different, um, uh, you know, like natural B vitamin iodine su su supplements and like things started to turn back on. But it, and I'd, I'd gotten off the birth control, but it took three years before like all of a sudden like sex drive comes crashing back in and yeah. like, and like, oh my God, now there's turn on for other people. Oh what no. The fuck do I, right. Oh no. I'm like, what do I do with that? Like, I, you know, but not just, I wasn't interested in like casual sex or, you know, things like just hookups or whatever. Like, I develop relationships. Mm -hmm. I'm like kind of what you would consider, um, I'm on a spectrum of uh, demisexual, right? So mm -hmm. the whole demisexual concept, right? I'm, yeah, I'm like, I took a long time. Um, Can you explain the concept of demisexual more? A little bit. I'm not super well versed in it. I'm actually, it's actually kind of new to me. Um, I think it's sort of like, <laughs> Google it and don't take my word. But uh, but I know that like asexual is somewhere kind of like in that spectrum. And I think that's kind of the far end of the spectrum of like not interested in sex at all, but still interested in deep intimate relationships. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, like you might have maybe on the other end of that spectrum, um, you know, like swingers and like people who are just into hookups, you know, and like casual sex, playful fun, like get in, get out. Like, I don't need to know anything about you. Right. So if you look at that as like being like this whole spectrum, then um, like demisexuals typically require a lot of connection. Like, I really want to know you. You have to have a good track record, like in terms of like how you show up in life. Um, I need a lot of evidence. That's, 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 over a long me, period of time that me, like we're to gonna that, build something solid to me that just sounds like standards <laughs> right but right but you know like so some standards are different for uh, yeah absolutely can be very different. It, it, it can be very different yeah yeah like but, my first yeah, partner right. my first partner that i got involved with um it was eight months before mm -hmm. i was like a yes to penetrative sex <laughs> right, okay, like, so cool. yeah that's, that's I, a, that is i think by modern standards, standards. a long time yeah yeah 
And and it was it was basically like that question in myself. You know, it was like I'd wake up next to him some mornings and be like, "Am I yes to a sex with this person?" And like the answer was coming from not necessarily inside me, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and it was just like, "Not yet, not yet, not yet." I'm like, "Okay, that's what that is, right?" And he wasn't really screaming for it either because there's so much there's so much potential for sexual play and like eroticism that almost like once you go into like the world of like penis and vagina penetrative sex, like sometimes that becomes like the fast route and you just land there, mm -hmm. yes. right? And like, well, what happened to all of the play, right? And so if that isn't yet part of your equation, the level of creativity <laughs> and the length and the duration of erotic play that can happen Right, like when, yeah, like just making out and like dry humping and mutual masturbations and toys and like that whole world is so rich and full and satisfying that like to spend eight months in that without like consummating it, you know, like is it's delightful. It's like, <laughs> it's, it's like, it's like dating in high school, right? Where you, yeah. you did a lot of making out, but then when you finally got to penetrative, you were like, whoa, because there was yeah. so much buildup to it. Mm -hmm. Your high school sex was like whoa. At my high school sex wasn't like whoa. I mean, let's 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 be, let's be serious. I did not have sex in high school. I had sex in college, so. Well, either way, making out nice. Either way, in college. yes. <laughs> so, I uh, can you tell me? Uh, you also are. Is it an erotic blueprint coach? Can you explain what that is? Absolutely. So if you've heard of the five love languages, this is an easy like tag on to that concept. And if you haven't, you should definitely read that book because everybody should read that book. It's a completely different concept. But the idea is with, with the, the erotic blueprints, everybody has like a, a semi, how do I describe it? It's like a semi predictable turn on style, right? There's five different blueprints. There's the energetic, the sensual, the sexual, the kinky, and then the shapeshifter, which is like all of them. And if you understand what your blueprint is, then like if you learn like the languaging around that, even just knowing that about yourself, right? Then you'll be able to convey that to your partner and share a shared language around like touch and touch skills. Like there's just a million different ways, even just to touch someone, right? And yeah, and so when you have this understanding and you have this languaging, you can have a much deeper, more fulfilling understanding of yourself and what gives you pleasure, even when it's just you and you, right? Like, how do I pleasure myself? What does that look like for me? Um, yeah, so when you understand that about yourself and about your partner, then you can really start to have incredibly expansive, you know, like exciting, magical, like erotic play. And yeah, so what I do is I help individuals and couples explore, well, learn the erotic bl blueprints and then explore that, you know, like with each other or explore that within themselves, you know, depending on where they're at and dynamic or relationship or single. Um, yeah, and then it just gets, sex just gets, keeps getting better and better. Do you find that that's a good tool for couples that might be having like desire discrepancies or, you know, maybe just like not quite matching up in that area is having a better understanding of the other person's blueprint and a good way to kind of get closer to the same page? Yeah, a hundred percent. Yes. That's exactly what it's about. Um, Cause yeah, kind of the foundation of it is a lot of, I found that a lot of people don't even know what they like. Mm. Right? Like, mm -hmm. touch me. How do you want to be touched? Hmm. I don't know. You know, like, I don't know. I don't know what I like. Right? There's so much of that, that you know, do you even know what you like? So level one is like, figure out what you like. And this process helps you explore that, you know, like explore it through like a system that that clearly explains, clearly defines and, and gives like games and like we do sex labs where it's actually like an experiment, right? Like you set up a sex experiment of like, hmm, will this turn me on? I don't know. And if it doesn't like, well, it was just an experiment. So there's no shame or failure, right? Mm -hmm. Like we were testing a thing, you know, like, nope, didn't work. Like, okay, well, I'm not bad, wrong, stupid or bad at sex. Like that just was not the thing. So mm -hmm. yeah. Like even just even just something as simple as like, okay, I'm gonna touch my arm. 
Now, if I want to do it like in the energetic blueprint, like that might not even be like touching. Some people are so sensitive that even just this, you know, this amount of pressure, which is I'm literally not even touching my arm or maybe just barely, just barely, you know, like touching the skin, the hairs. For some people that is orgasmic, like completely orgasmic, like don't even touch me, but just get really, really close, right? Tease, anticipation, feather light touch, eye gazing, you know, like waiting, wanting, longing, right? Like, so that would all be kind of like in the energetic. And then sensual, you know, would be much more like contoured touch. So I've got like my whole hand, I've got my fingers, I'm moving slowly. I am trying as the giver, right? This hand is the giver. I am wanting to feel my hand completely full, but softly so, right? And as the receiver, I'm feeling, yeah, like everything being caressed but smoothly, right? Now, if we're gonna go, so that's sensual. And in the sensuals, like they're gonna want a lot more um, beautiful environments are really important. Like the socks on the floor can completely throw a sensual off because like the socks on the floor make you think of the laundry, make you think of how you need to clean out your, you know, your, your living room and that broken cabinet that needs to be, right? Like it goes into this downward spiral, right? So that would be like sensual. So all of them have, um, superpowers and shadows, right? So like the sensual superpower is like being super turned on by everything environmental and all the, you know, like like this, this certain kind of touch skill, you know, but like the, the, the shadow is like, oh my God, like that, that's a fucking mess. And, and like, now I'm, I can't get into it. Or the, the lights are too pointy. <laughs> the lights are too pointy. Yeah. Can you show the other touches? Sure. See the yeah. other ones now. <laughs> right. Okay. So like, um, so, so sexual, right. Would be just kind of like more, like we've got a little bit more force, right. I'm like gripping a little bit more. Maybe I'm not moving as slow. Maybe I don't have quite as, as, um, as much flow as like sensual, right. So sexual mm -hmm. is going to have, so sexual is what we think of. Sexual is what we've been trained to think sex is. So when we watch porn, when we watch, um, you know, like erotic scenes in movies or in TV shows like that, that like, rah, you know, like, yeah. and, and, you know, penis and vagina and like fucking hard orgasm. Yeah. Like that's sexual and that's valid and it's awesome and it's fun. And the problem is, is that we've been acculturated to believe that that's what sex is supposed to be. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that's that would be sexual touch. You've got you know like mm -hmm. a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more grip, a little bit faster, a little bit more intensity, right? Um, and then kinky, well, kinky could be more like I'm gonna hold you, you know, like push you, pull you, pull you together, right? So then, yeah, and so there's you can kind of think of it on like um, you know like energetic is super light. It's it's barely even there, right? Just above, just the hairs. Sensual is just the skin, right? Sexual is now you're getting into fascia and muscle and kinky is like, now you're getting into bone, mm -hmm. right? If you look at it like really in a, in a coarse concept. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that very much defines each of those categories, so. Yeah, and so that's just, Right, like that's that's a 10 minute description of just touch on arm for those four, right? So each one has their own language pattern, right? Their own vocabulary, right? Like you wouldn't tell an energetic, like, I'm gonna suck your cock, right? Like that's way too much, you know? Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, right? Ah, too much, freak out, turn off, right? Dissociate, all those right. things, yeah. right? And you know, like, um. A, 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 you know, a sexual would probably be, you know, disappointed or confused if you're like, just want to sit here and look straight into your eyes. I could get lost in them. Just feel your energy. That's And a that's sexual is like, no way. No. Right? Yeah. Like, where's no. the certainty here? Where's the orgasm? Uh, are, we, are we getting at it? <laughs> right? Mm, I don't want to so look at your eyes. What are you talking <laughs> about? <laughs> right? Yeah. So... But yeah, so that's that's probably like the most common mismatch 
that happens in a lot of people's relationships is between, you know, one person is very energetic and the other person is very sexual because like opposites attract, right? And, but if you don't have that languaging and you don't have the knowledge that like both of those are valid, both of them have their superpowers, both of them have their shadows, all of that is real. The energetic, what ends up happening in a, in a dynamic that like that with, a, with the acculturation that we have in this society around eroticism, touch and sexuality, the energetic is gonna feel like they're bad, like they're wrong, like they're broken, something's wrong with me. Why don't I like what I see everybody else doing? Like I'm not normal, bad, mm -hmm. wrong and broken. It's not a very empowering place to come from erotic, no. right? And, and then the sexual in that dynamic might be like, um, I'm not good enough. Like I'm too much. I want too much. I don't know how to please my partner. My partner doesn't want me, you know, mm -hmm. and, and like, I don't know, I'm doing all the right things because this is what we've been acculturated to. And this has worked for lots of my other partners. And this isn't working, you know, for my energetic partner and and we're at a total conflict because then he the sexual right like will come at the energetic you know like Rawr! and then the energetic's like nah! freeze freak out and sometimes even just like dissociate completely and just like i'm not i'm not in it i'm not turned on yeah so when both of them have a really solid understanding of like oh this is you i see you now right oh and this is me I see me now, I can understand me now, and I understand where we're misaligned, but how can we find ways to play with each other, right? And so it might even just be like fully taking turns, like, all right, you're on the massage table this time. How do I please this body? How do I please this energy system? How do I please this soul? How do I calm your nervous system? How do I bring you into pleasure? And you explore and you play. Right. And so sometimes you start out with this, you know, like if you're if you're really working on on relationship to make it, you know, like more expansive or just begin re reignite connection. Right. Because a lot of times when we're fresh into a relationship, new relationship energy. Right. That NRE and that limerence like you just do like you. you there, there's a much higher likelihood. Most people, most of the time will be much more in the sexual blueprint when they're new in dynamic in relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And then as that goes on and that like that intensity of the, the cascade of hormones that is limerence, which is actually more closely related to obsessive compulsive disorder than anything else. Right. Like when that starts to calm and you start to like to return to your like more typical hormonal balances, then your true blueprint starts to reveal itself. And all of a sudden that person you were so hot and heavy with and it was so much chemistry like, oh, well, now that these hormones are becoming more like realistic. I don't feel the connection anymore, but I still love them. What the fuck do I do? Like maybe you're three years in and you've got kids and a mortgage and all of that and they're still beautiful and they love you and you love them, but like there's nothing in the bedroom anymore. Mm -hmm. Because the initial connection, you know, like was in an altered state. <laughs> uh, you know, like you're intoxicated. You're intoxicated in the beginning, right? And so as you move into like sobering up and like being in, into realistic love, Right, like then how do you develop the erotic connection if you are, are you aren't both actually, you know, like sexual or at, you know, as, as easily aligned in the blueprints. And that's why, yeah, that's why the erotic blueprints are such a powerful way to learn about yourself, learn the language, learn the vocabulary, have a way that you can actually start communicating with each other about what you want. And, and yeah, and to do so from a place without judgment or shame, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're just playing. We're exploring, we're running experiments, we're figuring it out. And then, yeah, if you have a coach like me, like I help you through that process. You know, like explore this game, watch this module, read this article, learn these things, check out this website, maybe consider buying some of these toys. You know, mm -hmm. like, yeah, so that's, yeah. Now, is yeah. it like one-on-one -on -one coaching or is it like a class where you go through, like you, cause you mentioned modules, so. Mm -hmm. Um, like when people are exploring this aspect of their sexuality, do they come and like take a six week course where it's like, do this homework each week, or is it more of like a one-on-one -on -one coaching that you diagnose and then help the couple or person in front of you? Both. It depends, right? Like it kind of depends on, um, yeah, what the, the couple or the individual is, is needing. Um, like how deeply do you want to explore this? Right. Um, so there, there is the option of, of just signing up like with an eight week course 
And then, you know, and in that, you know, like you can check in with me and I will provide answers and things like that. But if you want to have me coach you through that, well, I should say eight module course, right? Mm -hmm. Because some people will be like, ah, uh, one a week is too fast. My nervous system can't integrate all that, right? Mm -hmm. So like, okay, we maybe we do it every other week. So then it mm -hmm. turns into like a 16 week thing, but then, you know, like one week, your homework is to watch the module, play the games, be in the experience, be in the experiment. And then the following week, you'd have like a coaching call, you and your partner or you singularly with me and and discovering and exploring like, well, what's working for you? What's not? Where do you have questions? Where do you want to go? Like, is there somewhere in particular where you're like, I want more of that, you know, so you can discuss like specific challenges and specific interests. Yeah. Cool. And did you did you develop this or were you trained in the system and you are an educator in the system? I am trained in it. Yeah. The woman that developed it is her name is Jaya. And she she's this just incredible powerhouse of a woman. She's been in um, the oh, what's it called now? Brain fart. Um, somatic a sexological body worker um, field for like 20 years. And so in her experience of working hands-on with so many bodies through that particular practice, she started noticing these patterns, right? Mm -hmm. And like what's working on some bodies, what's not working on others. And from that body of knowledge, she developed um, the erotic blueprints. And so, yeah, I went through a year long training with her. I'm now part of her production team for live events. Um, we do VIP retreats down in Costa Rica. And yeah, like it's, the, I, I don't know how she does everything that she does. The, the level of quality, commitment, the elegance of the communication, the safety of the container, like all of that, you know, like she has provided for, for us coaches to learn. And then it's very like the, the community that we hold as coaches, there's a number of us, right? So you might not be right to work with me, you know, like, but there's somebody out there that you are right to work with. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, like the, just the whole, the impeccability and um, the elegance and the savvy sophistication of this entire community and how we do the work that we do is, I don't know, like I, I just, like I become speechless, right? I think about everyone involved and I just like am in awe. Yeah. So I'll just say, I actually met Jaya once at a valet in Hollywood uh, outside and I had like a 20 minute long conversation with her. She is amazing. She gave me a bag of sex toys. It was lovely. <laughs> like I do, I have to say she is an amazing uh, sex educator. There's tons of uh, documentaries and stuff out there that she's involved in as well. Mm -hmm. I'm sure yeah. if you Google her, you can find all kinds of things. Yeah. But yeah, and humanitarian work, and then and every every piece of knowledge that she continues to learn, right? Like she'll she'll find something and be like, "Does that work? Does it not?" Like she's constantly learning, and then she'll dive into it. Does that work for me? Does that work for my clients? Let's test this out for like a year, maybe more, before like she vets whatever it is before she brings it to be like, "Hey, coaches, this is going to help your clients." you know, like really have the expansion, have the growth, have the healing that they need. So like, yeah, she's an absolute pioneer in, in the whole, yeah, in this whole field, as are many of the other coaches that are, you know, that are in it, who are doing this work as well. Like, yeah, like I'm just thinking of like, like six of their faces all popped into my mind and I'm like, wow, oh my God, like amazing humans. Amazing. And for our listeners that might want to check her out, uh, how do you mm -hmm. spell Jaya? J A I Y A. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it, it's yeah. also very pretty as well. Like, that has nothing to do with her talent as a, you know, sex coach. She's, <laughs> she's, ne she's it stunning. It never hurts, though. It never hurts. <laughs> yeah. though. It never hurts. She's stunning. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And if our listeners want to connect with you outside this podcast, either on the blueprint work or for your callers, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, so you can go to liquidnymph.com. Uh, at the time of this recording, that'll redirect you into my Etsy shop. And it's just me and my husband in there, right? Like it's the two of us running this thing together. Most of the time he answers the preliminary questions that you might have about like custom work or whatever. And then if mm -hmm. it starts getting beyond his scope of, you know, like, oh, I don't know what is possible, then I jump in, 
right? So a lot yeah. of times you'll get him and then eventually you might get to me if it's too complicated or too intricate, you know, the thing that you're wanting. Um, and you can certainly message me through there about coaching if, if that's, you know, like where you land, you can absolutely do that. Or you can message me directly, uh, send me an email at uh, coaching at liquidnymph.com. And then we'll just start a conversation. Oh, yeah, mostly, I, mostly I work by referrals and, mm -hmm. you know, people coming to me. So I don't have like a fancy coaching page, you know, like just show up and we'll see if we're a good fit for each other. That's amazing. You have been just lovely to talk to. I've loved learning about your business and your life. And I appreciate you thank showing you. up and being so open and sharing with us. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh, yeah. This is only the second podcast I've ever done. The first one was actually with Jaya like eight years ago <laughs> when I was like a total introverted hermit. It was probably the worst interview she ever recorded. I was like, I don't know. Ah. Lots has changed since then. Um, yeah, so I just want to say thank you so much to the two of you for reaching out to me and 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 for for the work that you're doing and promoting, you know, like healthy sexuality and expansion and curiosity. Thank you. And thank you yes. so much for having me on. Awesome. Well, until our paths cross again, it was lovely talking with you. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I really enjoyed learning about the uh, the uh, erotic Sexual. blueprint. The, yeah, yeah, the, the sexual love language I thought was fascinating. I mean, I, not to say like Kismet's callers are amazing because we saw. Oh, them they're, at they're, AV, that's what they, attracted us. To her. Yeah, we met her at AVNs. We saw her callers. We love them. Like you mm -hmm. know, her her Instagram page has awesome pictures for anybody looking to see all the ways you can use an in yeah. uh, the the caller. But the erotic the erotic blueprint part was like, what is that? Like, I didn't know that yeah. we were going to learn. No, as soon as she started yeah. talking about that woman, I was like, I met her at a valet in Hollywood. Oh, I, I want to hear the story of how you met her at the valet because, like, so was, it, was, it was really like the universe popped it, dropped her yes, in. Yes, dropped her into my life. I walked, oh I literally was doing a gig at like the Roosevelt. I think it was the Roosevelt. I don't know why I think it's the Roosevelt. My brain's saying it's the Roosevelt. It might have been a different Hollywood hotel. But I was doing a gig there. And she was attending a separate event there. There was just like a really, really long line of right. to, to get valet. And like we had to valet or something. I don't remember what it was, but I was waiting for a valet, which I never would have done when I lived in Hollywood because I couldn't afford it. So somebody must have been paying for it. Yeah. Um, I yeah. But we were waiting and this gorgeous woman was just standing next to her. She had a cold back. She's like, hey, are you into sex toys? And I was like, yeah, I love them. And she's like, here. And she just handed me a bag. She's like, they're from our event upstairs. And we just started talking. She gave me her information. And I just, she was there with her, a partner. I don't know whether it was her husband or a partner or what. But just the most open, lovely. I can see how she's a sex coach. Because I was talking to her about sex within like a minute of meeting her. Right. And I felt so natural doing it. Like, right. Yeah, and she clearly left an impression because I don't remember everyone I've ever met at a valet in Hollywood, so. No, no, no. Though I have to say that there have been a good amount of parties in LA that I've I've gone to where one of the parting gifts was a sex toy. Um, it doesn't <laughs> happen anywhere else, but in LA, it's like, oh, here you go. Here's a vibrator. And you're like, what? Like, it was like she, she had like a couple of the gift bags and she's like, I don't need all these. Like, right. She's yeah. like, oh, she's a pretty girl. <laughs> Maybe she'll yeah. take a picture with it. I think I was there for a burlesque gig as well. So I was yeah. like all dolled yeah. up and in the, in all the things. So, but yeah, that's my, I guess that's my celebrity sighting. Your, your celebrity, uh, <laughs> my sex celebrity sex sighting. Sex sighting. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, but let me think. Oh, so you found some fun articles for us this week. I did. I, I, this is this is nice because these are all fun articles. These are not. They are all fun. I'm gonna pull up the makeup <laughs> girl's face because her face is just stunning. Why you t start telling that story? So uh, uh, this uh, Bailey, I I want to say it's Sar Saren. I could be saying it wrong, but this. I don't know. Sometimes the algorithm throws stuff at me, and I'm like, how did I even get on this? And I came across her Facebook video on the Facebook like 
video section and I was like, who is this girl? She is telling this super creepy story and putting on makeup at the same time. And that's, that's her gig is that she has a YouTube tutorials. It's not even a tutorial site for makeup. It's, it's, she tells a true crime story while she puts on a full face of makeup and it's like very dramatic makeup. And it's, it's fascinating to watch. It is just, it, cause she's so matter of fact in her speaking of these, and she knows all the details in and out. You can tell like she spends a lot of time researching this because she, you know, like it, it seems like she goes through court documents the way she's explaining it. Um, and it, she had this wet, she had this YouTube page since 2013 and it wasn't up until like last year that she started doing what she calls murder. Uh, it's called a uh, murder, murder. Mystery makeup and makeup. Yes. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And like I watched, I watched her one on Jeffrey, part of it on Jeffrey Donner, Dahmer today. And I was just like, this is so interesting how she even put these two things together. It, well, what's, one, she's a fabulous makeup artist. That was her YouTube page before right. uh, before the mystery murder part. Right. Um, but she, I mean, it's it's a kind of a juxtaposition because she's doing this gorgeous artwork and then putting up like graphic murder scenes next to it. Right. Um, which is just, which she's been criticized for openly because people are like, you're making light of these murders or... You know, which I think people might be taking it a little too seriously. If she's not making light of the murder, she's finding a new way to tell the stories. And I mean, this girl knows her stuff. It's not like she's not doing the research. Like she is doing as much discovery as a lawyer, it seems to me, because like she goes like she and and like I watched one where it was it was. I can't, I can't remember. It was the one in the article. So mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of them in the article. It's pretty good. It's actually an article by allure.com. So shout out to our publicist who got her that because it's a really good article. It covers yeah. several of her top videos. Um, it has information about her life, her thoughts about her work. Um, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Yeah. And she's, um, her videos get, so they seem to average like the good ones between 1 million or 2 million. So like, it's a very, it's, it's a big viewing for like a very interesting niche is what I thought was so interesting about it. Like, I'm like, you, you got to go through two parts of the Venn diagram to get to the center of murder. You got to go makeup. through the murderinos and the makeup people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> murderinos and makeup people. It's like quite the combination. But honestly, like shout out to her. The, the article was talking about how she actually sets up her filming schedule so she gives herself breaks and allows for mental health and all that good stuff, which anybody who's doing anything should give themselves breaks and allow for mental health. Um, but the thing I thought was fascinating was actually learning this was a channel. So check right. out the videos. Find her online because it is absolutely fascinating. Um, murder, mystery, and makeup. Yeah. So good. Yes. Yeah. So, so amazing. Like, all of it, I thought, was like, I'm like, wow. It's just one of those things where you're like, somebody – took the time to put this concept together and did it very well. And that's, I think what is like so impressive about it is you're like, she's doing a, I mean, I would have never thought of it, but she's doing it the best way she can. And she's killing at it. Yeah. Ha -ha. It's pretty cool. Ha ha. Pretty ha ha. Oh, I get ha -ha. it. It was a murder joke. Right. <laughs> um, okay. So here's another fun thing. We've talked about this a lot. Uh, sexting and emojis. We talked about this. Uh, a couple of podcasts to go, uh, yes. but this this is an article about a company that came. What are they called? Flirt emojis. Flirt emojis, which you can. It's an app you can enjoy. You can download. Uh, I don't actually know the price on it because it's not mentioned in this Cosmo UK article that we pulled it from. Um, but it, the way I came across this was, um, I I was actually looking for the right emoji to use when doing our post on Luke last week. And I know I've come okay. across this before where like, you know, you type things in and you see what emoji pops up. Yeah. And I, and I typed in handcuffs and nothing popped up. 
And that's actually not the first time I've done that. But like, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like what's the equivalent? You know, like I was like, oh, maybe yeah, there's like a shape. So then I Googled uh, what is like the BDSM uh, emojis. And this came up as an article. And I was like, oh, this is so cool because you don't have to like imply that there are it's handcuffs. There are actually are handcuffs, you know? Yeah, it's I mean, and there's. It's everything from tea people in bed, a pride flag, straight up buttholes, vaginas, yeah. uh, sex it's, dolls. It's, it is, yeah. I mean, lots of different, like, and they're fun, cute versions of that. So it's like, yeah. it's, it's a picture It's not a of graphic a, vagina. Right. It's like, oh, this is like a cute vagina. Like, this is yeah. like a, you know, like a Japanese vagina. Like, it's an emoji style um, which I think is the best part about it. Because if it's just graphic, it wouldn't be as much fun. Because you wouldn't be flirting. And this is flirt exactly. magic. Yeah. Exactly. Well, especially since nowadays everybody flirts and everything through text. It's nice to have a few more tools in your arsenal to use. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. So I thought it was cute and fun. And Flirt then emojis. Our- oh, wait, but then you also found something else that was super cute. I actually saw this on several people's pages. This went kind of viral, actually. I'll pull up the photo, but you're going to have to talk through what the photo is for people that are on the podcast because I feel like you almost need to see this item to fully appreciate it. Yes. So this 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 did become very viral in uh, my Facebook page, at least. And it is a uh, cheeseburger lingerie set. Um, it's so cute. It is so cute. It is like, uh, yeah, like it, there's a lettuce garter belt, um, a bun bra with like veggies and tomatoes sticking out. And there's another bun with the panties with like, like m- mustard and ketchup falling out of it. Um, it was a one-off for a friend, um, but like apparently, like uh, the woman who made it, who I believe is out of us, New Zealand, um, she just was like, she, she says she's gotten so many uh, inquiries about it, and it's adorable. Like there's little rhinestones <laughs> and the lettuce. It just is like super cute and unusual, and like it even comes a- with a pair of matching pasties. Imagine yeah. doing a cheeseburger in paradise number in this outfit. Which, like, every Jimmy Buffett fan in the world would love. Right? right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, it goes back to that, like, weird line between food and sex and how they, like, kind of come, they merge mm-hmm. and then they, you know. Um, so it's definitely something where, like, it's not for everybody, but, like, for someone who wants to do something cute or, like, for a uh, Halloween, I'm sure it's going to get knocked off. Of it, there's going to be knockoffs for Halloween this year about it because it just seems so uh, just like everybody was like, yes, I yeah. need, who knew I needed a cheeseburger lingerie, but like apparently but that's I what's do. So, but that's what's so great about burlesque, not to like bring it back to the heart of our channel, but burlesque makes getting naked fun. The reason this outfit is fun is because it's going to be on somebody's body right like yeah. that's what makes that's what makes it so fun it's such a just position and it's i thought i love it it's a it's a great burlesque act whoever ordered that oh, was yeah spot on unfortunately now her act is going to be knocked off so many ways so many ways yeah but like i mean <laughs> That person was the first, you know. Right? I can. Be, I was the first cheeseburger burlesker. She be, we better have to be able to open up our audiences and actually have people in an audience so that she can get yeah. videotaped before it goes away. <laughs> yeah, She's right? like, I'm the one who spent all the money, like, crafting this concept. Oh, I know. Well, yeah. I think it's so fun. I'm actually kind of in the process right now of doing some research for new costumes. Um, I can't quite say what yet. Oh, but I, there's I, I, a fun yeah. announcement that's going to come that'll be with new costumes. I just Ooh. can't think 
quite yet, but we're researching a bunch of new costumes with pinups. And when I saw this, I was like, I wonder. <laughs> I, I actually have something to show off. So give me one oh, second. Oh, please. Yes. Pat's grabbing something right now. And I'll point out as she's walking off the screen, she's wearing her I'd rather go commando I am, tank top, <laughs> which you can buy at pinupsontour.com. Okay. So, um, so I'm going to I'm gonna push back a little so you can see this. Okay. But I got my first Samba head. Ooh, I have it back. The samba head oh, how piece. fun! Are, what so, are you going to do to that? This is what it looks like. Oh, that's um, cool. Right. Where'd you get that? Etsy. Very cool. And uh, I am doing a, actually, for the food, which I, this was not intended whatsoever. Uh, I am, uh, I'm doing it. It's like I have a bunch of cupcakes that are like, mm -hmm. um, going to... Uh, glue on it it's going to be like a candy land kind of number okay um, costumey so it's I, super cute i have a tendency to uh pilfer all the really shiny stuff after christmas at all of the stores because it's yeah. all like 50 to 90 percent off and i have like all these like glittery cupcakes and donuts so i'm gonna make this like crazy confectionery headpiece i love it i love I it i love it i love it it's so exciting. I've been wanting to get one of those for about a year now. And I was like, fuck it. I got nothing to do. It's quarantine. Let me buy a, you know, <laughs> bolted piece. So, and it's really fun to walk around the house in when nobody's there because you feel like Cleopatra. Um, <laughs> oh my God. Really Anything that makes you feel more like Cleopatra is perfect. Absolutely. I can't wait. I, I like, I am like one day I'm like, uh, you know, as, cause I'm going to start wearing it as I'm crafting it. Of course, I wanted course. to show it off before it got all glittery, but I can only imagine like the Amazon guy showing up and I'm like, hi. <laughs> so fun. So fun. Yeah. I absolutely. love it. Well, yes. I'm just going to bring up sometimes on podcasts, we say things yeah. that we talk for about an hour every week and we sometimes smoke weed and drink alcohol while we're doing it and our mouths move before we can but uh yeah. Kat, do you have something you want to say uh yeah <laughs> i, I yeah. apparently put my foot in my mouth last week um and i uh said a word some words fell out of my mouth that we're not supposed to um so i wanted to take a moment to apologize wholeheartedly and take responsibility for my actions. And, uh, you know, sometimes we say things, we don't mean to say them, but like words get jumbled. Um, and I said a uh, word phrase that we don't need to repeat, but was an insensitive word choice. Um, so I wanna apologize and I wanna say I'm a human being and I'm looking forward to growing from this experience. Yes, and having been friends with Sat, Kat or Sat. See there, I misspoke. I can't even say your name right. <laughs> Um, having been friends with Kat for seven years, I know her heart and I would not be doing business with her if I did not know she was a loving and open human being. So yeah. that is, uh, our corrections corner for that the week. Is. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we should talk about the corrections I sent you because I, uh, from the view, because I, oh, think so funny. So, when we, okay. So Kat and I, we, we're very uh we're very conscious business women we want to we want to do the right thing most of the time so when this opportunity presented itself kat did a lot of research to kind of figure out what was the best way to say and what was the best thing to do and she came across this hilarious video from the view which i wish i had pulled up on the computer i don't right now but it's yeah. it's hilarious uh do you long story short frank and gracie or great grace and what is it that Frankie and Grace? Uh, Grace, Grace and Frankie, right? Yeah, it's Frankie, the Netflix Frankie series. Grace. It's so good, so good. The Netflix series, right? They were yes. on The View. And one of the storylines in that show is uh, Grace gets gifted a vibrator. She decides to start using it because of her age. She gives herself carpal tunnel. Right. They, oh, go ahead. And then, and then they start a vibrator line for elderly women that have larger buttons. Yeah, exactly. Larger buttons, an easier way to handle. Designed for the elderly user who wants to use a vibrator, get off, but doesn't want to have carpal tunnel at the end of the experience. Right. 
Um, what was so hilarious about this view clip is they brought this show on to talk. This show that the producers damn well knew what the show was about. Right. And then they wouldn't let them say the word vibrator. They had to dance around the word vibrator for a whole five minute segment on this show. Um, and at some and then, point, Whoopi, Whoopi Goldberg just gave up and she said the word vibrator. So it's the segment. And at the end of it is the add on on the clip on the end of the show where she had to apologize for using the word vibrator. She she goes, she literally goes, I'm sorry I used the V word. It was the most insincere apology I've ever it was seen in my entire life. It was literally like, are you really going to make me fucking apologize for using the word vibrator? Like that right. was, that's what was said. What was said was, I apologize for using the word vibrator. vibrator. But it was said with such disdain that I was like, yeah. She's not sorry about using the word vibrator. No, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> they, they, they did say something about it because it's the news. So I don't know if like, because they maybe were classified as a news category. They changed. Well, I think it's because they changed. So when The View started, it was an entertainment show, right? You had makeovers. Right. You had kind of like sensational type guests, stories, things, surprises. Okay. I think a uh, maybe about seven, eight years ago, they made the decision, we're a new show, which, mm -hmm. no, you're an opinion show. You're not a new show. Right. But they decided that was where they were going to go with it. And so I think when they changed the format, all of a sudden, talking about vibrators wasn't allowed. I bet right. you can find clips from the early 2000s of them talking about vibrators left and right on that show. Because that I, used to be what that show was, right. you know? I, like, like the thing about that clip when I sent it to you was at first I'm like, what did she say? Like, you know, it's, I had to rewatch that clip to understand <laughs> that the vibrator was the bad part of it because like, I was like, well, they weren't saying vagina. They danced around vagina left and right. <laughs> but I mean, it's just like, I'm sorry. Like I find it just so funny because like, are there not a ton of erectile dysfunction advertisements on television? Like, you it's, know, it's, 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 it shows the like, plant growing or like, yeah. Or like I a lot know. of times, a lot of times they'll do like a, a champagne cork popping on a fireworks um, going off fireworks, fireworks. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, I know. Oh. I know. It's it's interesting. You know, I, I have this conversation. I actually uh I'll overshare. I went on a date with a guy with kids and we started talking about my job and me being like, Well You went you went on a good date with the guy with kids. A really good like I've had a couple yeah. good dates with the same guy. This is this is promising podcast <laughs> land. Promising. But uh we were talking about uh my job and kids and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, honestly, like, it's a little, it's a little weird to be introduced to somebody's kids and think about being a part of their life and being like, well, what I think about sexuality might not be what your ex-wife thinks about sexuality. How is that gonna mesh? Because I can't sit here and lie to your kids. <laughs> But, you know, your ex-wife is Mormon, so let's, <laughs> that's just a conversation. But I, I was literally thinking, I was like, you know, because when I have kids, I don't know what I'm going to teach them. I've always thought that because I don't want to be taught what I was taught. That's for sure. Right. Uh, I, want them to, I want them to not have to make the mistakes I made to realize how awesome and valuable healthy relationships actually are. Like, it, yeah, you know. It, it's, I feel like I, I sometimes, is there a right way to teach it? But at the same time, it's so interesting. Like, uh, we think we've talked about this, not on the show, but we have, we're like, if you go to Burning Man, there are camps with kids in them. And I mm -hmm. just think, what is it like living in that environment? Like where you're bringing your kids to an event like that because like they get to see things that most of America thinks are taboo. Right. 
And like they grow up in an age and they're like, oh, this is okay. It's okay to have like a sex camp and it's okay to like for naked people to be running around and like. It's okay um, to do anything you want to do as long as it doesn't fucking hurt anybody else. Absolutely. Like, yeah. Um, and, yeah. It, and like the thing about sexuality I find so interesting is that most of the time there's always a charge to it. It's like talking about politics or God. We're like, it's, it's a little hard to bring it up at a dinner conversation. It's very funny when you work in a sexy industry, how you have to dance around that for the normal people to make them not uncomfortable. Um, yeah, it's definitely interesting because, uh, you know, I myself, I don't introduce myself as a burlesque producer. That's not like the way I, I don't, I don't go, I have a sex podcast. I'm a, right. I go, Oh, I do events and entertainment. And if they ask, I go corporate events and fundraisers. Mm -hmm. That's my stock answer for people I don't know because I don't want to go down the rabbit hole. You know what I mean? Like, it's a rabbit hole. Do you, like, on your uh, dating profile, do you put it up front? Like, it says producer pinups on tour on my dating profile. So, so, if so you you have every option to Google it if you want to know what that is. Like, uh, I don't put on a performer because I've discovered that attracts a different kind of person. Mm-hmm. Um, there's something about guys that like are into strippers that I'm not super into. <laughs> you know, like I don't want to date the guys that want to date a stripper. <laughs> Where you know? it's like it, it's like they want to date a stripper so that they can say they've dated a stripper. You know how many guys I've been on dates with? Where in the first date they tell me, "Oh, I've dated a stripper before." I'm like, "That's that's great." That's great. Totally cool. Not my job. Right. You're <laughs> not a stripper. That's not my job. That's you. I'm glad you dated a stripper before. I'm sure she was lovely. I'm sure she wasn't dating anybody else. I'm sure. No. no uh, I'm sure you were her only one. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I mean, it's it's so funny because I, at least for me, because I have been a stripper, like I'm always like, I'm putting it out right in the beginning. So that if yeah. anyone who wants to eject can eject. Can just leave. Right. Like, because like I don't wanna I don't wanna be a person who hides it and like five dates in, you find out because you're like, oh this is not. yeah. It's I like- mean, I usually it's interesting because you know, I, I live with Matt, who's a male, right. who's straight, right? And when I date these guys, they meet my straight male roommate, who's like obviously a straight male roommate. And I remember he was like, Well, has he seen you naked? And I was like, naked? No. 90% naked. <laughs> right. Seen you in a bikini. Like, see, see me on like, stage in pasties. Right. Like, no, like, yeah. Like, I'm like, yes, but that's not, it's not even, yeah. I was like, but so has like thousands of other people. Like, it doesn't even like equate to me. Like, and I don't think it equates to him either. So, you know, no. it's one of those things. Where I'm always like, no, I get it. It seems weird. But like everybody in my life has seen me naked. And I've seen most of the people in my life naked. So it's just, it's just my world. It is, it's kind of nice. And it's, it's really funny because like when you get to that level of comfortability with nudity, you forget that a lot of the population does not have that level of comfortability with nudity. Mm-hmm. So, so like, for example, like, you start working at a strip club after a while you're having conversations completely nude as you're like getting ready in the back room. And like, sometimes like you don't even realize you just don't have clothes on, but like, you know, you're putting on your makeup, like whatever. And it's not even with the girls, like with the managers, like the manager will come down and talk to you. And you're just like having a, like a business conversation standing there naked. And you're like, I don't care. Like it's it, like, it just drops. And they've said that like a lot of times it's like, uh, like anyone who, I, I remember, uh, what was that show? Uh, Masters of Sex. Like, there were so many sex scenes in it that they would just walk around naked all the time because they were so used to it. Like, we're, we're, it, they just stopped wearing fucking robes after a while because yeah. they're like, whatever. Whatever, I don't care. Like, you know? So it's, it's, yeah. it's definitely a spectrum of comfortability, and it's always interesting when you take someone who's very comfortable and you put them in a situation where maybe the people around them are not, in my opinion. <laughs> I remember this situation. I don't know if you were in the bathroom at the time or not. I think you were on this tour. 
Um, but I uh, went into, I, I think I was wearing a jumper, like pretty similar to the one I'm wearing now. I don't have a bra on right now for those of you right. that are seeing on the, for those of you who are listening on the podcast, you didn't get to see that. But um, I was wearing a jumper similar to this into a gas station on tour. This is like my uniform on tour is jumpers every day because you don't have to wear underwear and you don't have to wear bra. It's perfect. Some woman made a comment about how no one wants to see my boobs without a bra, like out in, and I was like, when we were in the bathroom and I think it was Dixie at the time, like laid into her and was like, isn't it a shame when women put other women down? Like, you know, like whatever. But I remember just being like, my tits are making you so uncomfortable that you have to verbalize it in a bathroom with a line of women out the door just so everyone knows you're not cool with my nipples. Like, right. I literally, I'm literally coming in here to pee for five fucking minutes. I was supposed to put a bra on to come pee for five minutes. Like, please, please. But it, I mean, the thing is that that just shows her. You know, the thing is that we only call out things we're insecure with mm -hmm. because otherwise we just let them ride. We're like, oh, that's that's cool. I don't care if her tits are hanging out slightly because like she seems comfortable with it. Why do I need to call her out on it? You know, so it's oh. like it, it shows her insecurity of the situation. Funny tit story. Um, and another <laughs> guest and another guest we should have on the podcast, Valerie Stunning. Uh, she has. Yes. I was just thinking we should have Valerie yeah. on. Uh, so she has a, a new ice cream ring. Ice cream. And, yes. Yeah. And she has a cart that she takes out in the arts district. And we I went out on a date the other night in the arts district. And I walked by and she had her face mask on and her whatever and a line. So I didn't stop. Mm -hmm. But as we were passing, I was like, I told the guy I was on a date with, I was like, oh my gosh, that's that's Valerie stunning. She's, she's actually a really, really good stripper and burlesque for like amazing, beautiful. Um, but she yeah. just, this business, we should get ice cream on the way back. Um, uh, and he was like, okay, the one with the side boob. And I was like, yes, the one with the side boob. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, yeah, yep. 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 That's her. Yep. <laughs> Oh I was like, God. her whole face is covered. Like, all this is covered. But the one with the side... I didn't even notice the side boob, but he did. So... Because he's <laughs> of a dude. And he's she's stunning. Dude. And her yeah, body... No. Stunning. St Valerie Stunning is stunning. Look her up. Honestly, she's a really good uh, advocate for sex workers. Yes. Um, She does a lot of uh work to kind of... Uh, I think she's part of, like, a couple of nonprofits that do work with it as well. So check her out, Valerie Stunning. I we will ha we'll have to reach out to her because I would love I to know. I know. not I only like, hear about her life before, but I would love to hear about this new chapter of her life as a business owner. She's working so hard and doing so well and getting all kinds of great press here in Vegas. Yeah, and they're really fun. Um, like I know one of them I saw recently on her social media was uh, there's some because they're they're sandwiches, right? They're ice cream in a sandwich, or are they just it's like, ice cream? I it's li a little cart that she has, so I think there's multiple mm -hmm. things that she does out of the little cart. Mm -hmm. So I think you can get a regular yeah. ice cream, or you can do like the sandwiches. Okay, but uh, one of them was called the girlfriend experience, which anyone who like a good amount of people in the sex industry. Like, no, this is like one of the go-to uh, experiences when people are looking for fantasies. And I just thought that was so adorable that she named it the girls, the uh, the girlfriend experience. Well, we'll have to get her on then. We'll have to yeah. have her talk about it. Um, but if you yep. want to see our last interview with Valerie Stunning, you can do that on yes. our YouTube channel, which is at WTT Burley. Uh, we have interviews with Valerie Stunning as well as a whole bunch of other amazing burlesque artists from the Burlesque Hall of Fame weekend uh, for um, a couple of years ago. I'm not going to give the year. I don't remember what year, but a couple that years ago. A, that was actually the start of the channel, if we want to get That specific. was the start of the channel, yeah. yeah. And uh, if you want to connect with us, you can always do that on our Facebook page or Instagram at WTT Burley or on our website, WTT Burlesque where you can listen to past episodes of the podcast as well as in iTunes, Stitcher, and anywhere else you listen to your podcast. 
If you do like us, please consider leaving a review that says a couple nice words. iTunes ranks that stuff so high in whether or not people find us when they search us. Um, so please rank us, leave a review if it's nice. If it's not nice, um, send us an email. and or, uh, or just type in three emojis. Like you don't even <laughs> have to write words. Just write, just put like a kissy face and a heart and like maybe the bikini. And that's good. That's like, good. Or you can find the flirt emojis and leave yes, them. exactly. <laughs> Bringing it around. Yes. Oh, that's what we call a callback. That's what we call a callback. Occasionally my comedy training comes out. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that's it. That's we're, we're here just trying to figure out what's better than sex. So, yep. Which is still yeah. nothing. Still nothing. We haven't figured it out yet, but we're going to try every week. And until next time, we have more guests coming up for you the rest of the month. We'll see you guys yep. soon. Bye. Bye.